Come on, stand to your feet for just one more time. Will you please, just out of pure reverence for God's word, we stand. And Lord, as we approach your word today, I pray, Lord, would you give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. As we open up the pages of your word, Lord, I pray that you will give us heavenly downloads, strategies from heaven. Your word is not just ink on paper, it is active and alive and it will be at work in us. Our faith will increase, our faith will grow, and we will release our faith for miracles in our lives and in others today. Lord, would you give us a heart to obey? I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ today. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you've got your Bibles, please make your way to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I mentioned I was in Japan and then Singapore for just a few days last week. And while I was there, I got a text message from Alex and Madison. They have a brand new baby boy. So I'm so excited for them. And as I looked at that little picture, I thought, he just, oh, they got a picture of him. He just looks so perfect and adorable and at peace, all snuggled up in that blanket, the little cool hat on. And I thought to myself, what is, what is he going to need to reach his full potential? I mean, to reach the absolute best of God's design for him. Do you know what he needs? Parents. That's what he needs. When anybody wants to reach their full potential, one of the major things they need is this gift called parents. We're in a series on family today talking about family. This is God's heart for you. And a very integral part of family is this role called parenting. It helps us reach our full potential. So I'm thinking about this this beautiful baby celebrating uh, with Madison, Alex, and texting back and forth. And then uh, the next day, I went to a meeting with some of our missionaries. I met one of our missionaries who runs a uh, home for children in Cambodia. And he shared a story about Esther. Esther was a year and a half old when her grandmother was caught trying to sell her. How? Could something like that even happen? Yet it does. Family that was meant to be a blessing, parents that were meant to be a blessing to Esther somehow dropped the ball in a major way. Fortunately, Esther landed in our home for children in Cambodia where she found out family is God's design for her. And she got a chance to discover what family can look like and what it means to be nurtured and cared for. And you are part of making that happen for Esther. As I'm thinking about Esther and I'm thinking about uh, Madison Alex's new baby boy, I was certainly reminded when our daughter Sarah was born and I held little Sarah in my arms as a very young man, not even knowing what I was really getting into. Like it was easy to have a child. It was fun to have a child. But the battle, the, the big deal was now the rubber hits the road. Now it's this thing called parenting. How am I going to do this? Isn't it? It's always interesting to me that throughout life we have so many courses we have to pass to get to the next thing. But parenting, you just have to know how to make a baby. Ready or not, pow, there you are, parenting. I didn't know what to do. How am I going to do this? As I'm weighing all this out, like what is, what is she going to need to reach her full potential? How can I fill this big role called father? How can we parent this child? And that's when Sarah peed in my arms. And I really quickly said, here you go. And I learned quickly, hey, when things get rough, we don't get to just give our kids back. When it's difficult, we don't turn them back in, right? We don't love when it's just easy to love. No, we get peed on, puked on, sometimes ignored. But we do what God calls us to do, and we parent. Parents are a gift from God. So today, I want to talk to parents. Now, hold on for just a second, because lest you figure, well, this isn't for me because I'm not a parent. Here's the thing. Someday, if you want to be a parent, you need to listen real closely because you're going to get some help today. And it's better you learn it now than you wait till later. So this is for you. If you're a biological parent, this is for you. If you're an adoptive or a foster parent, This is for you. If you dare pick up the mantle of being a spiritual parent, which all of us are called to do in some way, to somebody else, then this message is for you. 
Yeah, I pray. It was interesting. I was at a church in Singapore, and they used this verbiage, spiritual parents. I said, I really like that. I like the way that sounds because we know from Ephesians 4, one of the most, one of the most often verses I pray for you, that we would be knitly joined together, each member doing its part, each part of the family doing its part to help somebody else grow. That's a picture of what it means to be a spiritual parent. Hebrews says it this way. He says, hey, some of you guys, you've been around long enough. You ought to be teachers by now. It was as if the writer was saying, you ought to be a parent, a spiritual parent to somebody else right now because he used the language. Instead, you're being like a baby when you should be like the parent to help somebody else grow. So parenting is for all to say, this word today is for me. Now, you got to say that again, but a lot more enthusiastically. Say, this word today today is is for me. Thank you. I agree. Parenting. Okay, here here we go. Before we get to Mark 10, Ephesians chapter 6 says this. It's very fascinating to me that Ephesians 5 talks about marriage. This is God's ideal for a marriage. A husband is like Christ. Each, Each mate being unselfish, loving their spouse. That's marriage, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 6 is children obey your parents. There's marriage. There's having children, which introduces this role called parenting. Next comes, we wrestle. Isn't that interesting? Marriage, children, and oh, we wrestle. Let's pick it up. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, a final word. And this is my final word on this particular series on family. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we wrestle. Say, we wrestle. We wrestle. Yep, for we wrestle, not against people, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We do wrestle. I've entitled this message, Parents, fight for your children. Their life depends on it. Parents, fight for your children. Why? Because their life depends on it. When I held little Sarah in my arms, the thought that did not cross my mind was this. This child is in a battle. This child is born into a spiritual battle. All of hell will fight for the attention, the affection of this little girl. It's a fight I can't ignore. It's a fight I can't afford to lose. It's a fight I must win. That thought didn't cross my mind. But nonetheless, there is a spiritual battle raging for our children. Have you noticed that all of hell is fighting against our children. Have you noticed a spiritual battle for the lives of our kids? How do we win that battle? That's what we're going to talk about today. In the Bible, there's a man, a dad, whose name isn't mentioned, but his, his spiritual battle for his son is vivid. He cannot ignore it. It's a fight that he has to win. And this is what we find in Mark chapter 9, verse 17 says this. One of the men in the crowd spoke up. This is the dad. And he said, teacher, speaking to Jesus, I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out this evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. He fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, Since he was a little boy, the Spirit often throws him into the fire 
or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. There was a very real spiritual battle going on for this dad's son. Again, it was a battle he couldn't ignore. How, how could any parent ignore their child being completely demonized? Their child thrown, did you hear the words, often into the fire, into the water, that this evil spirit was trying to kill him. What was God's answer to a child being tormented? What was God's answer for this child's freedom? It was a parent. It was a parent who wouldn't give up. It was a parent who would go to Jesus. It was a parent who would, who would see not just what was, but who could see what could be and would dare fight for their kids. Parents have such a God-given critical role. Their freedom of their children is linked to a parent. That's what we see happening here today. How do we see the enemy fighting against our kids and our families today? We, we might not always see kids writhing on the floor, foaming at the mouth, but we do see child pornography. We see kids so, so exposed to, easily accessible, and often becoming addicted to pornography. We see kids addicted to a smartphone that often makes us dumb. Addicted to social media where they get judged and, and they are constantly hearing, I'm not enough, I should be like that. Our kids face all kinds of very real demonic attacks. As parents, we cannot afford to sleepwalk through the days when our kids need us to fight for them. Recently, in California, just last week, I believe it was, a law was passed that for the first time that I know of in the history of the world, children are now being allowed to lead the parents. Because if parents do not affirm a child's gender identity, what they feel their identity is, then those parents now will be lumped together with parents that are abusing their kids that don't feed their kids, and those kids can be now taken from their parents. What? Listen. Listen. Children's brains are not fully developed until they're 20, at least 20 years old. Did you know that a child's brain, children function out of the feeling. This is a fact. It functions out of the feeling part of their brain, not the decision part of their brain. As an adult, we learn to function. We have feelings, but we learn to function also out of our decision-making part of our brain. Kids don't have that. What do they need? They need parents to help them process what they feel, to learn what is right and what is wrong. More than ever before, parents are needed to step into this God-given role to give their kids guidance, to listen with big hearts to what their feelings are, then to help them process those feelings. To teach them that it's true. There really is, I know I just said it, I'm going to say it again. There is a right and wrong. And it's a parent's job to set some guidelines, some boundaries, to say, hey, this thing is wrong, this thing is right, this is bad for you, this is good for you. Thank God for good parents. Thank God for godly parents. And listen, I know, I know not everybody grew up with godly parents. Some of you don't know who your dad is. This is one of the beautiful things about being in the family of God. That when you're in God's family, everybody has family. And the blessing you're meant to receive in your biological family, God makes sure you get in his family. It's true, family is God's heart for you. So how do we win this battle that Satan is fighting for our kids and our grandkids? 
fighting for those that God's called us to be a spiritual parent to, a life group leader to, to help invest in them and help them reach their full potential. How do we win that battle? Number one from our text today, we see this simply powerfully come to Jesus. I love a dad that came to Jesus for help. Come on, we take our kids to a lot of places and to a lot of things, don't we? But there is only one place that really is going to matter for all of eternity. That's take your kids to Jesus. This begins with you coming to Jesus. The best thing you can do for your kids is for you to come to Jesus, not to tiptoe around. Like, I, I love summer. I know it's coming to an end. Ah, I love warm. I'm too skinny for cold, so I love warm. So summer I love we go on vacation, we run to the beach, and I notice at the beach there are those that just tiptoe around the water. They, oh, it's cold. That's not how you do it. You, do, you back up and like, I know it's going to be cold, but here I go. <laughs> There's only one way to come to Jesus, and that's to come all in. I'm all in. I'm not tiptoeing around the edges. I'm all in. And when we come to Jesus all in, we become part of his family. The Bible says all things, all that old stuff gets passed away and all things become brand new as we become a whole new creature in Christ. We begin to be on a pathway to reach our full kingdom potential as we come to Jesus. Simply, powerfully come to Jesus. I want to encourage you uh, this year and next year specifically, for what's coming our way, you must be around the family. You've got to be around the family. I pray that within the next couple of years, God raises up a plethora of spiritual parents who say, I'm going to help grow somebody else. For some of you, you've been around long enough. It's now time for you to start investing in somebody else. It's time for you not to just go to the life group, but for you to be the leader of that life group. So I don't know how. You don't have to know how. You just have to know how to love people, to care about somebody, to listen to them, to invest in them, to create an atmosphere where they can flourish and grow. I encourage you, you want to be around the family more than ever before. There's a reason the Bible says in the last days, Even as you see the day of the Lord's return approaching, all the more you need to be in this gathering of the saints. That's a gathering like now and corporately we all come together and that gathering where we meet in homes with each other. It's imperative the around the family. So number one, how do we win the war? We come to Jesus. And in us coming to Jesus, we are bringing our children to Jesus. I was raised in a family that I was brought to church On Sunday morning, on Sunday night, on Wednesday night, and any other day the church was open. Yep, I think it's good for you to bring your children to God's house. But listen, parents, you want to bring your kids not just to God's house, bring them to Jesus. Because you can be around God and godly things and never know Him. The Pharisees were masters at that. You have to bring them to relationship with Jesus. You, we learned this in the series, Parents, it's your role to disciple your kids. Amen. The number one person you're discipling is your children. So how do we win the war? Number one, we come to Jesus. Secondly, I put down forgive. Here's the thing. We can't fight for our children when we're busy fighting our past. We will never fight for our children if we're too busy fighting our past. Everybody at some point in time gets hurt. Somebody did you wrong. Somebody said what they shouldn't have said. Somebody in life hurt you. If that hurt is allowed to fester, if it's allowed to stay there, that hurt has the power to paralyze you and keep you from bringing healing to somebody else. That's why I say parents, those that will be parents someday, those who desire to be foster parents, those who desire to be spiritual parents, we have to be people that are quick to forgive. Has anybody here ever been offended by somebody else? 
Okay, come on. We all breathe air, don't we? We're all around imperfect people, aren't we? What you do with that hurt, what you do with that offense has everything to do with where you're going to do and those you'd ever be able to help. Why must we be quick to forgive? We've got to hold on to hurts, offenses, wrongs, like a hot potato, <laughs> like a bad investment. You don't, nobody holds on to a bad investment. You just get rid of it as fast as you can. Pain is a bad investment to hold on to. There was a study done a years ago. Um, was it at Penn State? Uh, University of Pennsylvania. They, they took dogs. And fortunately, the law prohibits them from doing these kind of tests today. But back in the day, they took two groups of dogs. Uh, the first group they would put in a maze with obstacles, and the dog would have to go through the maze and jump over obstacles to get to their food. The second group of dogs, they strapped in harnesses. And these harnesses would give these dogs electrical shocks, 64 random shocks. They didn't know when they would come, how long they would last, Six, about 64 shocks in a 60-minute time period. These dogs would be tortured, never knowing when the pain's going to come, not knowing why or how this is happening, not able to get that harness off of them. After that was done, they'd take the harnesses off. And again, thank God they're not allowed to do that today. Then they would take these dogs, take them over to the same spot where there's the maze to get to the food, a few obstacles. And here's what they found. The dogs that had been hurt, they would get in the maze, they would instantly start running through the maze. But as soon as they came up to the first obstacle, they would just lay down. What happened? They had the ability to jump over that obstacle. They knew the food was on the other side. What got shocked out of them was the ability to even try. Do you know what happens when we hold on to hurts? Real wounds that somebody else gave us, it paralyzes us. It's not a matter of it just tainting our past. It can paralyze our future if we don't forgive. Yeah, forgiveness is key. Our kids, our grandkids need us to fight for them. And we cannot fight for them. We're too busy fighting what happened yesterday or last year, 10, 20 years ago. So what do we do? We forgive. And we forgive quickly because God has quickly forgiven us radically, beautifully forgiven us of so much that it's only right that we forgive others when they've wronged us. I think of Kevin Tunnell. He was 17 years old when he was driving drunk, and he, he killed an 18-year-old girl. Of course, he feels horrible that he did that. The family sued him, and they won the lawsuit for $1.5 million. But the family said, I don't want him to pay $1.5 million. We're going to settle for $936, and that is to be paid $1 a week for, the, for 18 years for the life of our daughter that he stole from us. They didn't want Kevin's money. They wanted Kevin to hurt. They said, you hurt us. Now, we want to hurt you for 18 years. We want you to have to send us $1 so you just remember and are never allowed to forget what you did to us. Everybody walks through life. Some, somebody hurt you. Somebody drank too much, and it killed a daughter. Somebody spoke too much, and it killed part of you. We all have to decide how much will we demand for a payment. And in doing so, we would only really paralyze ourselves. Instead of hurting those that hurt us, we're really only hurting and crippling ourselves. What's the answer? Forgive. Forgive. When you forgive, it does not mean what they did was okay. It doesn't mean what they did was right. It's not you setting them off the hook. It's you setting you off the hook. It's you saying, hey, I'm more concerned about moving on with my future than be being tied to the past. And here's the thing. If we don't forgive, 
we will not be forgiven. Forgiveness is a must for our today and our tomorrow. So how do we win the fight? First, we come to Jesus. Secondly, we forgive. Lastly, we don't give up. I love the tenacity I see in this dad. I love that when he came to find Jesus and could not find him, he said, hey, disciples, you guys help. And when they couldn't help him, he didn't just tuck tail and go back home and say, oh, well, I guess this is the way it is. Instead, he's still there looking for Jesus. He did not give up. And when he finally found Jesus, because he came to him, he said, help us if you can. To which Jesus said, Verse 23, what do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked, anything is possible to the person who believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. I love that Jesus, when he saw there was a crowd, he's like, okay, let let them see what the Son of God can do. So when he saw the crowd growing, he rebuked that evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and it left him. The boy appeared dead. In fact, a murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. What is the link between the boy writhing on the ground in a convulsion, being controlled by a demon? What's the link between that moment, that tormented moment, and the moment where Jesus picks him up? And brings him to his feet. Do you know what the link was between those two? A parent. It was a parent that came to Jesus. A parent that was not too too caught up in their own hurt to not care about their kids' hurt. It was a parent that would not give up. Parents, you hold the key to the future of your children. You're the link to the best that can be. And when parents fail, and they do because none of us are perfect, God so beautifully gives us a family called the family of God that also is not perfect, but God will use that family to make sure you get the blessing you were intended to get in your biological family. Come on, please, if you've not yet become part of a life group, I so implore you today, go to the Connect Center, uh, text, whatever you got to do, but say, hey, I'm going to make sure I'm going to connect with God's family. I want to be part of giving the blessing to somebody else, and I want to be part of also receiving that blessing that God intended for me to receive inside of the family. Parents, I would encourage you to not give up. I said at the beginning, we get peed on, puked on, ignored, but we love not just when it's easy to love. We love not just when everything's going fine, but when everything goes crazy, we still love and we still expect the best for our kids. We have the ability as followers of Jesus to call down another world, that kingdom realm, into the lives of our kids. We have the ability to pray a hedge of protection around them physically, around their minds, around their hearts. We can pray that God will guard and guide their friendships. And as difficult as it can be at times, and when it looks like someone has gone just way too far, listen, don't give up. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. And keep on loving. A final word. Final word for the family. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. When you feel like I don't have enough power, then rely on his mighty power that is at work in you. Put on all of God's armor. Why do I need armor? Because we're in a fight. All of hell is fighting for your children and grandchildren. 
for the future generations in your family line, for the kids that are yet to be. So put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. To follow Jesus rightly means you and I are going to live against the current of culture. We will go against the grain of what everybody else thinks is normal. For we wrestle not against people, not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against very real principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. If you're a parent, would you please stand to your feet right now? If you're a biological parent, foster parent, adoptive parent, if you're a spiritual parent to somebody, you're helping somebody else grow. In that way, you become a spiritual parent to somebody else. Parents, I applaud you. I hope today that you hear, you hear heaven applaud and say, job well done. Good job. Thank you for loving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for not giving up. And hey, hear heaven say, I never expected you to be perfect. You've just got to be present. You don't have to be perfect. You've just got to be present. You've got to stay in the fight. Parents, thank you. The Bible tells us how we overcome evil. Romans 12, 21 says, we overcome evil by doing good. So can I encourage you today? Do good to your family every day. How do we overcome evil? Do good. When? Every day. Every day you can give your kids, your family the blessing. Every day you can give the blessing of acceptance. Every day you can give the blessing of meaningful touch. But I'm not a hugger. Get over yourself. Every day you can give the blessing of encouraging words. Our kids are being so beat down with negative words that others say, and that they say to themselves, use the blessing of encouraging words every day. Every day you and I can give the blessing of honor by placing high value. Listen, make sure they're heard. I would encourage you, why not set, you could do this as a life group, why not set a blessing event one or two times a year? You invite the family to it, if it's your life group, your life group family, it's a family in your home, it's that family, say, hey, you know, we're gonna hold a blessing event, it's on this day, tell them ahead of time so they can get excited and get, it, get some anticipation built up. On that day, why not make a meal that is their favorite meal, not yours? I learned that our grands, you know what they like for breakfast? Cheerios and ice cream. Done. Now for all of you healthy people, I know that's not forever. That's just like a random, not like every day. So I don't need the emails. Pastor Kev, don't, you're going to kill them. I get it. Then why not take their hand in some meaningful touch and pray over that meal together? Why not sit down and give a blast of encouraging words? Why not think ahead of time of five to 10 things that you want to so say, this is what I appreciate about you, not just what they've accomplished, but about who they are, about the character they've displayed. One dad took an object, he took a sponge, and he gave it to his son, said, son, this year, I've watched you like a sponge. You've absorbed God's word, and I've watched you squeeze out love all over your brothers and sisters. You can do however it works for you. You can do something like that. You could end with communion. It's then you lay your hands on, just like Jesus did, and you pronounce a blessing, impart a divine advantage, powerful and life changing, to do good when? Every day. Parents, would you take just a moment and would you pray for your kids that I'm going to pray a blessing over you. But right now, I want you to pray for your kids. 
There's a spiritual fight going on for your kids. Whether they're younger or older, the fight remains and it's intense. The enemy doesn't take a day off and your prayers and love can make all the difference in the world. Pray that God protect them. Pray that God gives them a heart that longs to know Jesus better with every day. Pray a hedge of protection around their friendships and all of their relationships. Pray that God will guard their mind. That God would guard their heart. Stationing angels around them on every side. Pray a fiery wall of protection around your family. And now I pray for you. I pray for each parent and grandparent. I pray for those that desire to be parents someday. For those who have become a spiritual parent to somebody else. Every life group leader. Everybody who's taken the mantle of helping somebody else grow in the faith. I pray for them now. And I pray for you, my brother and my sister. And I pray that God strengthen you. I pray that as you consistently come to Jesus, he gives you everything that you need to fulfill that role, parent. I pray you walk in forgiveness. I pray you refuse to hold on to hurt and offense, but rather you are quick to forgive. May God make you unoffendable. And I pray that God work in you a tenacity, like a pit bull that refuses to give up. It matters not what you see, you see what can be, and you speak to that. You declare not just what is, but what is meant to be, what is God's dream over your family. You declare that and speak it and prophesy it into existence. And I pray for the sweet friendship the sweet, intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit to be felt in your home. I pray this today as a blessing in the name of the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that message of hope and have been encouraged in your relationship with Jesus Christ. What is the next step God's asking you to take? I would encourage you to check out Growth Track. It's our delight to come along your side and help you reach your full kingdom potential. To give now, you can simply click give on our website or text any amount to 84321. It is your faithful giving that allows us to continue to preach the gospel and make disciples from our neighborhoods to the nations of the world. Thank you and God bless you.